ACAST powers the world's best podcasts. Here's a show that we recommend. Hey everyone, Matt here from P1 with Matt and Tommy, the only Formula One podcast you need ahead of the brand new season. We'll be here every week with reaction to the latest news on and off the track, previews of the biggest races on the calendar, and everything you need to know about the fastest sport on earth. So whether you're a seasoned veteran or you've just started watching the new season of Drive to Survive, we've got you covered. Absolutely everyone is welcome. Are you ready? Well, let's go. Search P1 in your podcast app to subscribe and listen now. Acast helps creators launch, grow, and monetize their podcasts everywhere. Acast.com. Welcome to episode number 227 of Real Life Ghost Stories. And to kick things off this week, I would like to say thanks to some of our newest Patreon subscribers. I would like to thank Jessica Manning, CJ Cook, Emma Kearns, Corey Henderson, Nikki Ridgers, Adrienne Silva, and Anne Spiratos. Thank you so much for subscribing to the Patreon. I love you and appreciate you every single day. And our film review this week, our film review is Nocebo. Nocebo was released in 2022. It has 5.8 out of 10 on IMDb and 71% on Rotten Tomatoes. A fashion designer suffers from a mysterious illness that puzzles her doctors and frustrates her husband until help arrives in the form of a Filipino carer named Diana who uses traditional folk healing to reveal a horrifying truth. So this film for me was like a total random pick. I was just cruising Netflix and I was like, what's going on in the horror world? What have I not seen? What have I missed? I hovered over Nocebo, looked at the synopsis and I thought, oh, this this looks interesting. And it's got relatively good scores, like 5.8 out of 10 and 71% are not bad scores at all. So in terms of the likes for this film, like it was definitely original. It was a great story. I had figured out what was happening pretty early on in the film, I think. And that wasn't necessarily a flex. (laughs) That's, That's not me being like, look at me. I'm so clever. I figured it out. I think it was a combination of the fact that I've read a lot about this particular topic that the film deals with. And the protagonist says a key phrase that made me go, oh, I think I know what's happened here. And and like I said, definitely an original film, a really interesting story. And it's also an Irish Filipino made film, which I loved. So it was made by the film boards in Ireland and in the Philippines. A lot of it was filmed in Ireland. And, you know, I always like to champion an Irish film where I can. And I loved the themes of Filipino folk magic and folk medicine that ran through the film. I don't think I've seen a horror film that centres around Filipino folk magic and folk medicine and I was intrigued the entire way through and I do think and I've said this before um this this film is about a woman who is a fashion designer and I don't want to say anything more than that because I don't want to give away what happens in the film or the storyline of the film I think it's really important to use horror films to comment on social issues I think it's a really powerful thing to do and I really enjoy horror films that comment on social issues. Like horror films don't necessarily have to be ghouls and ghosts and monsters. You know, there's nothing wrong with those films. They are equally enjoyable in their own right. But horror that is very human can also be just as terrifying. And like I said, there was a huge emphasis in this film on Filipino folklore and Filipino folk medicine and folk magic. And I was really fascinated by it. And it genuinely made me want to do an episode on Filipino lore and legends. I didn't have the time to look it up properly this week and kind of redesign an episode around it because I felt like I need to give this the time that it deserves and make sure that I, you know, research it properly and find proper stories, etc, etc. But honestly, there's a whole storyline about Filipino witches, which I think were called Ongo in the film. 
and this this wee girl seeing this Filipino witch and the legend is that you you can't see a Filipino witch die and if you do then there will be consequences to it and I thought it was just brilliantly done and really fascinating and I absolutely adored Diana she was the Filipino nanny that came into the house I thought her character was brilliant she was dark she was powerful and scary but so human and so likable and I believed her like I believed in her story and I believed in her abilities and by the end of it I honestly was like you go girl (laughs) and it is difficult to talk about dislikes with this film um without giving too much away about the plot so I'm this is going to sound quite vague but I guess if you watch it you might understand or feel the same way about the film but I did like I said, I appreciated the message of the film. I like films, horror films that deal with social issues. But I did think that the message was pretty ham-fisted. Like, the message is a good message, right? And the message is important. But I did wonder if there was a slicker way of making the point. Because I felt like it... I felt like the last 15 minutes felt similar to me as the last 15 minutes of the film Men. So in the film Men, the last 15 minutes are really gratuitous and hammering home a point and it is grim and I I really did feel like I was going to walk out of the cinema and I I never <laughs> walk out of films but I thought I get I get the message I get what you're trying to say please stop it like you're hitting me in the face with this and I don't think it's achieving anything I don't think it's making the film better and I'm not entirely sure what you're trying to achieve from making things this gratuitous and while the end of this film it isn't gratuitous In a similar way, it did feel like being smacked in the face with the message. And I did wonder if there was like a slicker way of making the point. And maybe there isn't. Like maybe there isn't a slicker way. Maybe actually it needs to hit us in the face. Maybe we need to have these social issues in horror films presented to us in a really obvious and explicit way. And, you know, maybe it's a case of I want it to be, you know, subtler because the message is quite difficult to watch. I don't know. I really hated the two main characters in the film. I can't even remember their names. (laughs) But they annoyed the shit out of me. I know that's the point. I know sometimes you're meant to really not engage and not connect with particular characters in films. But I felt like the two of them, I was just like, oh my God, shut up. You're both so fucking annoying. And part of that, I think, was parts where the dialogue was just a bit rubbish at times. It was a bit of a clunky script at times and I felt like that sometimes took away from the depth of the story. And I'm not entirely sure if it was clear whether or not they were trying to portray the main character, the fashion designer woman, if they were trying to portray her as a real villain or a bad character. I I wasn't really sure. Like there was a moment in the beginning of it where she is um, about to do a catwalk for kids. She designs clothes for kids and she's inspecting the the child models and she gets to this little boy who has chocolate on his on his t-shirt and she's like chocolate oh well let's get this changed augustus gloop and i was like um i i don't know if that's if it cuz she sort of said it in this like nice friendly jokey way but it, it felt like a really unkind thing to say to a child and i was like is this bad writing or are you a real bitch i d- i don't know which one it is And I wondered if the characters had been more likable if there would have been more depth to the film. So if I if I enjoyed the character of the fashion designer and her husband, if I liked them as characters, if I really felt sorry for them, if I really felt sorry for her with her mysterious illness, would the reveal that happened throughout the film, would that make me more shocked and horrified? Would I feel differently about Diana's character? Would I have liked her as much or would I have thought what is she doing and and why is she behaving in the way that she's behaving and that's the thing with films you know they're so subjective somebody else could watch it and really like those characters or say no actually it was clear that they were meant to be not very nice people or not very likable people or somebody might watch and think oh I really didn't like the character of Diana but all in all like I was genuinely impressed with this film especially as a film that I had heard nothing about I'd never heard of it didn't know anything about it Like I said, I'm a big fan of talking about Irish horror films and I was really, really excited to see an Irish and Filipino collaboration on a horror film. Is it like mind blowing? No. But is it interesting? Definitely yes. There is like a whole thing in this film as well with, um, just as an aside, there's a whole thing about ticks 
as in the insects that like latch onto your skin and drink your blood. I think they call them pill bugs elsewhere, but I might be making that up. Um, I hate ticks. They really freak me out. They give me the heebie-jeebies. So if you're somebody who's freaked out by ticks, this is this is going to make your skin crawl a little bit. But in all, it was original. I enjoyed it. I was into it. It inspired me to do a Filipino episode. I'm here for horror films that try to do something new and try to comment on social issues in a way that doesn't feel preachy. I was into it. I'm going to give it three and a half stars. So that's three and a half stars for Nocebo. Which brings us to our story this week. Now, our story this week. Now, you might think to yourself when you listen to this story and you hear that the topic is about cursed video games, you might be like, but I'm not, I'm not actually that into video games. Don't worry, neither am I. I'm not into video games either, but I do love this topic. And researching this episode, I found out a piece of information that literally made my nerdy paranormal heart skip a beat. Oh, this, this, this particular episode links back to an episode that we did a long time ago. That is a very famous paranormal story in the most unlikely way. And I'm so excited to share it with you. Maybe this is common knowledge already. I mean, I didn't know. But let's, let's get into it. And today we're going to be deep diving into the world of cursed video games. All the links for the sources that I used for this episode are in the description of this episode. And there are lots of articles and videos in there that are well worth a read if it is something that you are interested in. So let's get into it. In the vast landscape of modern entertainment, few mediums possess the immersive power and universal appeal of video games. From humble beginnings in the laboratories of pioneering engineers to multi-billion dollar industries shaping global culture, the history of video games is a testament to human ingenuity, creativity and the relentless pursuit of technological advancement. The genesis of video games can be traced back to the early 1950s, when academics and scientists began experimenting with electronic computer machines. One of the earliest precursors to what we now recognise as video games was Nimrod, a computerised version of the ancient mathematical game Nim, created by British engineer Ferranti in 1951. This rudimentary program laid the foundation for interactive digital entertainment, although it was far from the immersive experiences we enjoy today. However, it wasn't until the 1970s that video games began to enter the public consciousness on a broader scale. In 1972, Pong burst onto the scene, captivating audiences with its simple yet addictive gameplay. Developed by Atari founders Nolan Bushnell and Alan Alcorn, Pong simulated table tennis with two-dimensional graphics and very basic controls. Its unprecedented success marked the birth of the commercial video game industry and set the stage for the medium's exponential growth. Throughout the 1970s and 1980s, the popularity of video games soared, driven by the proliferation of home consoles and the emergence of arcades as social hubs. Atari's 2600 console, released in 1977, brought gaming into living rooms around the world, offering a diverse array of titles from adventure games to sports simulations. Meanwhile, iconic arcade games like Space Invaders, Pac-Man and Donkey Kong captivated players with their innovative mechanics and compelling gameplay experiences. The 1980s witnessed a golden age of video games, characterised by technological innovation and cultural significance. Nintendo's introduction of the Nintendo Entertainment System in 1985 revolutionised the industry, introducing beloved franchises such as Super Mario Bros., The Legend of Zelda and Metroid to a global audience. These groundbreaking titles not only pushed the boundaries of gameplay, but also transcended cultural barriers, becoming enduring symbols of the medium's power to inspire and entertain. As computing power continued to advance in the 1990s, video games underwent a seismic shift from 2D sprites to immersive 3D worlds. 
The release of Sony's PlayStation in 1994 marked a new era of gaming with titles like Final Fantasy and Metal Gear Solid pushing the boundaries of storytelling and graphical fidelity. Meanwhile, the rise of PC gaming fueled innovation in genres such as first-person shooters and real-time strategy games, paving the way for iconic franchises like Doom, Warcraft and Half-Life. The dawn of the 21st century brought about further evolution in the video game industry, with the advent of online gaming and digital distribution platforms. Massively multiplayer online role-playing games like World of Warcraft and EverQuest transformed gaming into a social experience, allowing players to connect and collaborate in virtual worlds. Concurrently, platforms such as Steam revolutionised game distribution, enabling developers to reach audiences directly and fostering a thriving independent game development scene. From the pioneering experiments of early engineers to the sprawling virtual realms of the present day, the history of video games is a testament to human innovation and creativity. As technology continues to evolve and society embraces new forms of interactive entertainment, the journey of video games remains an ever-unfolding epic, filled with endless possibilities and boundless imagination. But there's a catch. There's always a catch. Video games caused outrage from their very beginning. People were frightened of them. They seemed to have a hypnotizing power. Young people staring at screens for hours at a time. What if this was dangerous? And was it possible that these games could be used for mind control? Could these games allow things in? Could these games be cursed? There are a lot of cursed video games dating right back to their genesis. And for this episode, we're going to be deep diving into a few of the most cursed and most dangerous games. It wasn't long after the dawn of video games that rumours of cursed consoles began. In the 1980s, video game arcades exploded in popularity. Games arcades were generally dark and dingy and were often the talk of the older generations who worried about criminality lurking in these dark hangouts. Perhaps they should have been more worried about the games themselves. Berserk was an arcade game that was named after the Berserker novel series by American science fiction author Fred Saberhagen. It was a multi-directional shooter maze game and it was one of the first games that utilised speech synthesis, which was genuinely revolutionary at the time. The robots would shout things like, The humanoid must not escape. And if they killed you, they would say, They would say, Got the humanoid. Got the intruder. The player was a human stick figure that ran through a maze, killing robots and avoiding an indestructible smiley face that was known as Evil Otto. The game itself is not said to be cursed. It was one particular games console in a medieval-themed games arcade called Friar Tuck's Game Room in Calumet City in Illinois. According to J.W. Ocker in the book Cursed Objects, Strange But True Stories of the World's Most Infamous Items, in the game, if you touched the walls of the maze, you died. If a robot shot you, you died. If a robot touched you, you died. And if you were in the maze for long enough, Evil Otto would bounce onto the screen and if he caught you, you died. And if you played Berserk in Friar Tuck's game room, you died. The first victim was a boy named Jeff Daly. Jeff Daly was in Friar Tux and was smashing through top scores in Berserker. He held two spots in the top score rankings, which was pretty impressive. And on this day, he scored another top score and dropped dead right there in front of the machine cabinet. The score? 16,660. Except this story is very likely a total fabrication, but it does seem to be based on very real events. It's a sad story. Peter Borkowski was 18 and was indeed smashing through the top scores in Berserker in Friar Tux. His initials were emblazoned on two of the top scores. Once he had inputted his new top score, Peter left the machine to play a new game. 
he dropped a quarter into the new machine and dropped dead. The autopsy revealed that he had an unknown pre-existing heart condition, but the coroner concluded that the excitement of the game had put his heart under pressure. But it is true that this could have happened after any activity that had caused that level of excitement. Because of this incident, the authorities did indeed investigate this cabinet, just in case there was an unknown electrical issue that had contributed to Peter's death. And there was another death that became associated with Berserk. In 1988, a group of teenagers got into a fight at Friar Tuck's and a boy named Pedro Roberts stabbed another boy, Edward Clark Jr., in the chest. Clark later died from his injuries and although there is no official report that details what started the fight, there is a story that one person had left quarters on the Berserker machine to signify that they were set to play next and another teen stole the quarters to play himself. Perhaps this is actually what happened. But it seems more likely that the details of the Berserk machine being involved were added later to further perpetuate the rumour that this particular console was cursed. Interestingly, there are no other Berserk games cabinets that carry a death toll, just this one in Friar Tucks in Illinois. Friar Tucks closed down in 2003 and the whereabouts of this cabinet is unknown. Pokemon was, and continues to be, a global phenomenon. In 1996, the game Pokemon Red and Green was released on Game Boy and was hugely popular all over the world. And while the game did well globally and seemed to have no adverse effects, in Japan it was a different story. Worrying reports emerged from Japan of a huge spike in children taking their own lives. It was reported that soon after the game was released, There was a spike in suicide rates, and 200 children between the ages of 7 and 12 had taken their own lives. And there was a link. They all had taken their own lives directly after playing Pokemon Red and Green. But that wasn't all. Reports began to emerge of game players experiencing migraines, dizziness, nausea and even hallucinations while playing the game and some began to question if the game itself was cursed. Soon people whittled down the cursed component to a particular level in the game called Lavender Town. As the name suggests, everything in this level was overlaid with a hazy purple hue, which actually made the level look infinitely creepier and more sinister than other levels. And then there was the music. The music was said to be haunting, and some believed that the music was imbued with secret signals that only children could hear. These notes and signals were supposed to induce suicidal ideation in the listener. Nintendo denied that any such musical notes existed in the Lavender Town level music, but allegedly enough complaints were received that they changed the music. Now look, I did consider playing the music in this part of the episode, but as you guys know, I tend to err on the just-in-case side of scepticism. The link to listen to the original Lavender Town music is in the notes for this episode, so you can decide whether you want to listen to it or not. What's interesting is that within the comments in this video, there are a lot of people who reported that when they were children, this music terrified them, that it made them feel uneasy, that it made them feel sick. And there are some who claimed that it just made them feel calm and nostalgic, But those are likely the same people who had imaginary friends. The third game we are going to discuss is The Elder Scrolls III Morrowind. Elder Scrolls III was an open world action role playing game and the game makers encouraged players to create modifications for the game. These mods covered everything in the game. New weapons, new armour and skins, new characters and new quests. This is a fun way for players of the game to be directly involved in the processes of gameplay itself. Except for Elder Scrolls 3, this call for mods threw up something that seemed to have been incredibly sinister. This mod was called jvk1166z.esp. At first, this seemed to be a computer virus rather than a mod. It would freeze the screen and all saved games would be erased hugely frustrating for avid gamers. But then someone realised that the mod wasn't just a virus. 
it was actually playable. But it could only be played on a special software for playing old PC games and the gameplay was simultaneously bizarre and sinister. A 2017 article on Mysterious Universe describes the gameplay as follows. Opening the mod immediately shows that all characters in the game have died and causes a player's health to rapidly deteriorate if they stay in any one place for too long. Upon dying from this apparent glitch, a new non-player character would appear who looked to have limbs that were long and unsettling, like those of some insect or spider, and which was called the Assassin. This character was said to scamper off and then proceed to haunt the player throughout the rest of the game, appearing and skittering about in the shadows and lurking around corners. Another strange detail about the mod was that at night, all of the characters who had supposedly died would come out at night and gaze at the sky, simply saying, Watch the sky. The weirdness would only get worse when a new dungeon within the game was discovered, which proved to have its own strange tales. Within this dungeon, it was said that there was a hall of portraits which was lined with pictures that were allegedly plucked straight from the player's own pictures folder on their computer. This was unsettling to say the least, but just as odd was that this hall of portraits purportedly ended at a door that seemed to be locked and to have no way of getting through. The frustrating mystery supposedly so absorbed some players to the point of obsession that they eventually went mad. Even more bizarre, it is said that if one spends enough time trying to unlock the puzzle of this locked door, the assassin is said to materialise in the real world. Is this all just hallucination, urban myth, or what? Who knows? There was one story that I was aware of before I started researching for this episode. And it was going to be the story that I opened the episode with, just a short anecdote about an urban legend. But when I was researching, I came across a BBC investigation into this legend... And in this investigation, a name was mentioned. A name that we have come across before on the podcast. Someone who I did not expect to come across in this research. Our story first appears on the internet on a website called coinop.org. And this is the exact post. Game summary, we need information. Game details. This game had a very limited release, one or two backwater arcades in a suburb of Portland. The history of this game is cloudy. There were all kinds of strange stories about how kids who played it got amnesia afterwards, couldn't remember their names or where they lived, etc. The bizarre rumours about this game are that it was supposedly developed by some kind of weird military tech offshoot group, used some kind of proprietary behaviour modification algorithms developed for the CIA or something. Kids who played it woke up at night screaming, having horrible nightmares. According to an operator who ran an arcade with one of these games, guys in black coats would come to collect records from the machines. They weren't interested in quarters or anything, they just collected information about how the game was played. The game was weird looking, kind of abstract, fast action with some puzzle elements. The kids who played it stopped playing games entirely. One of them became a big anti-video game crusader or something. We've contacted one person who met him and he claims the machines disappeared after a month or so and no one ever heard about them again. Until the ROM showed up. And here's what we found so far. Found English strings, insert coin and press one player start and only it looks like a one or two player game. The text in the game says, circa 1981, Sinislotion, maybe a German company? If anyone has any additional information about this game, we'd appreciate hearing about it. Quick update, we have recently received some new information about the game. Today is May the 16th, 2009. And yes, one of us is flying to Kiev, Ukraine tomorrow. And yes, the trip is related to this information. Stay tuned. And that's the end of the post. So the story of Polybius is as follows. It was a mysterious black box game that showed up in an arcade in Portland and Oregon in the Lloyd Center Mall. 
According to creepybonfire.com, its geometric patterns and vibrant shapes hypnotized players, leading to rumors that it triggered memory loss, seizures, blackouts, and hallucinations. Some even claimed that two teenagers vanished after playing the game. Adding to the intrigue were reports of men in black periodically servicing the machine, sparking speculation about government involvement and the CIA's infamous MKUltra mind control program. Allegedly, Polybius's addictive gameplay and subliminal messages led government agents to extract data from the arcade machines, further fueling the belief that something sinister was at play. However, concrete evidence for the existence of the game remains elusive. The first public record of Polybius appeared in 2000 on coinop.org, that's the post that we just read, where a single image of the start screen provided the basis for the game's myths. The copyright date attributed to Sinisloschen Inc., which means mind-raising loosely in German. And the lack of official records led to the FBI to actually deny its existence. Interestingly, the name Polybius itself comes from an ancient Greek philosopher born around 208 BC. Polybius was known for cryptography and puzzles, and he was also a firm believer that it was the job of a historian to only report that which was provably true with evidence. Polybius also means many lives in Greek, and realistically, Polybius is probably the perfect name for a video game. The story of Polybius gained legendary status pretty quickly. It was written about in gaming magazines where the claims were said to be inconclusive. Polybius has been seen in the background of The Simpsons, it's been in the background of films, it's been in music videos, it's been the subject of documentaries. Comments appeared from a man who claimed to have worked on the Polybius game development, fanning the flames of the legend. These comments were later outed as a hoax by Stuart Brown in his documentary Polybius, the video game that doesn't exist. But here's the thing. The Polybius story isn't necessarily a lie. This might be the most exciting and nerdy discovery that I've ever made while researching for an episode. Three years ago, in 2001, the BBC did a mini-documentary investigating the story of Polybius. That's how legendary this story is. The BBC did an investigation. The link to watch it on YouTube is in the description of this video. In this little documentary, the documentary makers interview a woman who is a journalist in Portland and grew up in the 80s deeply immersed in the gaming scene. Her name is Kat Despira, and she maintained that lots of elements of this story are absolutely true. Firstly, as we've already outlined in this episode, people were absolutely getting sick and in some cases dying while playing video games. Of course, the colours and graphics on video games could cause migraines and dizziness, and people became ill and sometimes died after gaming marathons. In this era, people were literally attempting to game for 60 hours non-stop. Of course, there would be adverse effects. Gaming arcades were often seedy and dark places, and police forces and the FBI were absolutely keeping a close eye on the activities in arcades. Black box games genuinely did pop up in Portland, as it was a place where new arcade games were tested. It seems that the Polybius story was the perfect recipe for an urban legend. But where did it come from? Or more importantly, who did it come from? This is where Kat Despira mentioned a name that made me stop in my tracks. She believed that the person who created the Polybius story had to have lived in Portland. There was so much truth in the story that it had to be someone who had grown up in the gaming scene in Portland. And then she came across a Portland man called Kevin Manis. Now that name might ring a bell for you, it did for me. And my immediate reaction when I heard that name was, no way. Captain Spear realised that Kevin Manis had created an online urban legend in 2001. A legend where he sold a box on eBay that he had bought at an estate sale. A box that he believed was haunted. Kevin Manis was the original owner of the Dybbuk box. As a journalist, 
Kat believed that Kevin Manis had created the Dibbit Box story and the Polybius story, so the BBC tracked him down and interviewed him. He refers to himself as an interactive storyteller. When he was interviewed, he described the process of creating an urban legend on different platforms. And when he was asked directly whether he had created the Polybius myth, he responded that he would definitely do that kind of writing. Now, let me tell you, dear listener, when I heard Kevin Manis' name, it was one of those moments where I really, I really wished that somebody lived in my house or I really wished that somebody <laughs> who understood the paranormal was was near to me, that I could be like, excuse me, I just want to tell you this this really ridiculously nerdy paranormal fact that I've just heard that I've never heard before that I did not realise. And maybe the belief that Kevin Manis wrote both the Dybbuk box myth and the Polybius myth is common knowledge. Like maybe those, maybe, maybe lots of people know those two things, but I did not. And Kevin Manis really intrigues me as a person. So I'm not sure that he created the Polybius myth. I think it's, there's a possibility that when he was contacted and asked, did you create the Polybius myth? He might've been like, well, I, you know, there's, I have nothing to gain from saying that I didn't. And I have everything to gain from saying that, from not saying anything and sort of making ambiguous statements that might imply that I did create it. But we know that he definitely created the Dybbuk Box story. And the Dybbuk Box story, and I'm sorry to say this, people get a bit annoyed when I say this. There is tons of evidence that points to the fact that that story is an absolute fabrication. Evidence that includes Kevin Manis himself saying that he fabricated the story. And I think it's a very good story. I think Kevin Manis clearly recognised early in the, two, in the 2000s that you could use platforms like eBay, you could use platforms like CoinOp to be able to create these viral urban legends, create these myths. If he did create the Polybius myth, I mean, he did it very well because the post that he created had just enough truth in it for it to be believable. It is still talked about to this day. When I was researching for this episode, I saw multiple posts where people were talking about the Polybius myth being real, where people firmly believe that this video game was created by the CIA in order to what? Not entirely sure. And that this video game severely impacted children, caused hallucinations, nightmares, etc, etc. Like I even saw a post, I think it was on Reddit, that was like, I know this story is made up, but I still can't help but believe that it is true. And of course, like I said, there are elements of this story that are true. And like I said, I think that Kevin Manis is a very talented writer. Like he refers to himself as an interactive storyteller. But the Dimmick Box story is a, is just that. It's a story. I do find it frustrating that people have made huge amounts of money out of people's belief in the Dibbick Box when it is just a story. Um, there are plenty of articles out there that outline Kevin Manis stating that the Dybbuk Box story was made up by him. Um, the subsequent owner who wrote a book about the Dybbuk Box and then sold the rights of the story to make the film The Dybbuk Box, he, when he was, you know, faced with the claims that Kevin Manis made the story up, he said, yes, Kevin Manis made the story up, but he then cursed the box and that's why the box is so powerful. So this story about the box being bought from a Holocaust survival at a yard sale and it containing a Dybbuk, which is a sort of demonic entity from Jewish mythology, seems to be untrue. And the truth to the Dybbuk box story is is widely available very easily online. And yet people still engage with the story and people like Zach Bagans, for example, are making huge amounts of money out of the story. And I'm saying this as somebody who has visited Zach Bagans Haunted Museum and seen the Dybbuk box in person. You know, people want to believe it. People want to believe that this story is true. And I think that is genuinely a testament to Kevin Manis' ability to create a story that is believable and that has longevity. And as is often the case on this podcast with, you know various stories we never let the truths get in the way of a good story and clearly there's enough truth in the Polybius story that makes people go yeah but you know in the 80s in Oregon these things did happen you know black box games were put in Oregon as testers the FBI and the CIA and the police force were monitoring 
these particular places, these games, arcades. Kids were getting sick. People were getting migraines. People were dying while playing video games. And I need to be really clear, I'm not remotely trying to vilify video games either. It's been a hot topic, I think, since video games came out. When people die from playing video games, it's because they, like I said in the episode, because they, you know, try and do these exceptionally long marathons. People have died from dehydration. People have died from exhaustion from playing video games. There are people, obviously, like with the game Berserk, who played the video games, got incredibly excited, had heart conditions, their hearts were not able to manage the pressure that their hearts were being put under. So when I say that people died from playing these video games, that's what I mean. And do I think that any of these video games are cursed? Absolutely not. But do I think these stories are interesting? Yeah, they're completely fascinating. I'm fully sure that the creators of Pokemon, for example, the Lavender Town level, pretty sure they were not expecting that people are going to be like, this is really creepy, this is really scary, this lavender hue over the level makes it look creepier, the music is creepy, and kids are taking their own lives after playing it, etc, etc. I'm sure they didn't expect that, and they were like, oh shit, like, we, that's not what we meant, we just thought it would be a bit different as a level. And in regards to the Pokemon Lavender Town um, level that allegedly caused children to take their own lives, there doesn't seem to be any evidence that that actually happened either. But yet, here we are still talking about it. And I do think a part of that is to do with the fact that video games are inherently divisive and have been since since they were created. You know, parents and adults and lots of people have worried that video games played for a long period of time can have adverse effects on young people, especially video games that are potentially violent. And while that might not necessarily scientifically be the case, it's easy to see how these urban legends and stories have hung on for so long. Video games can of course have a hypnotizing effect on young people and they can of course be addictive. So these stories that come with these video games, it seems reasonable that people would share them and in some cases believe them and pass them on. And when I was researching for this episode, I mean Jeff Daly's alleged death, um, it seems to be completely fabricated, but yet Jeff Daly's death is quoted in lots of articles about cursed video games. Even though the story about his death isn't true, there are real deaths that happened that were very similar to that. But for some reason, his this, this name, Jeff Daly, is used. So again, it's another case of there is truth in the story. It's not necessarily holistically true. But there are elements of truth in it and just enough elements of truth for that part of the story to be passed on. And to be honest, I'm not really a video game gal, but I found these stories really interesting and engaging and entertaining. And it just made me think about video games, you know. I don't know if you guys had favourite video games from your childhood. I'm sure that most people listening will have had some video games that they've played before. But my favourite childhood video game was Pandemonium. If you remember that game, then please let me know because it was so good. I loved it. I bought it a couple of years ago and played it obsessively for about three weeks and then I haven't played it since. And, you know, on top of video games being cursed, there are also lots of terrifying video games. One night, I decided to play the video game Dead Space, I think it was. Pretty sure it was Dead Space. And I was playing it on the Wii, so that's how long ago it was. And I didn't realise that the Wii controllers made sounds. So in the middle of playing this terrifying video game, my controller suddenly started singing to me uh, in a child's voice, singing nursery rhymes. And I literally turned off the game and went and stayed in my mom's house for the night because I was so freaked out. So regardless of whether you think video games are cursed or not, they are still very powerful. Can be very enjoyable, also can be very scary. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Remember, like I said, all the links to all the sources for today's episode are in the description of this episode and lots of those articles are well worth a read. The video from the BBC is well worth a watch. And the video of the music from the Lavender Town level is in there to watch too. Now, I watched it. I didn't really feel anything when I was watching it. But lots of people in the comments said they felt freaked about watching it. So watch it at your own peril. 
Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. If you've got a terrifying story that you would like to send in, you can do so by emailing it to reallifeghoststoriespodcast at gmail.com. You can also check out the website reallifeghoststoriespodcast.com. And if you are desperate for some extra content, you can subscribe to the Patreon. That is patreon.com forward slash stories, where for $5 a month or $2 a month, you get access to heaps of extra content, as well as every single main and mini episode completely ad free. And on that note, I shall see you next time. 